In today's collect, we said, O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. It's a wonderful prayer. Our gospel lesson today is the transfiguration, and that collect points to it. Even though August 6th is the official celebration of the Transfiguration, it fits well here in the last Sunday of Epiphany. Because Epiphany is about the revelation of Christ to the world. You'll recall that this season begins with the arrival of the Magi, the first non-Jewish people to welcome the King of the Jews. They were the first to see Jesus for who he was, though they did not see it fully at the time. And as we work through the Gospels during Epiphany, bit by bit we learn more about Jesus. Who he is and what he has come to do. In many ways, the transfiguration is the high point of this revelation. Jesus reveals and confirms who the disciples have believed him to be. And this strengthens the faith of the disciples. Something that they will need to hold on to in the coming days as Jesus moves on toward his passion, death, and resurrection. But it is also important because this event comes on the heels of Jesus teaching his followers about carrying their own cross. Something that makes sense in light of our Lenten disciplines which are coming this week. So let's talk about this passage and see what it says to us. The first thing we need to look at is the context. The transfiguration comes at a crucial time in Jesus' life and ministry. First, Peter has confessed Christ just one chapter before in Mark 8. Jesus asks the disciples, who do people say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. Secondly, Jesus has foretold his death and resurrection in Mark 8, 31. Jesus says, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. This is troubling to his disciples. They do not yet see just what that passion, death, and resurrection will mean for them and for the world. And finally, Jesus has taught the people about following him and calling the crowd to him with his disciples. He said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So when Jesus comes down the mountain after the transfiguration, he will offer more teaching. And twice more predict his death before heading into Jerusalem for the final time. So this is a very important point in Jesus' life and ministry. But in order to understand the transfiguration, you've got to understand that you hear something that you hear real estate agents say over and over again. What do they say? It's all about location, location, location. Where all of this is taking place is very important in understanding what is taking place. The confession of Peter, the prediction of Jesus' death and resurrection, the call for his followers to take up their cross, all happened at Caesarea Philippi. This was a town about 30 miles north of the Sea of Galilee at the base of Mount Hermon. It was a center of cultic worship, particularly of the god Pan. It was the center of worship for another group of pagan gods, as well as the worship of Caesar, hence the name Caesarea Philippi. People would go through all sorts of pagan rites and bizarre sexual rituals at this place. There was a deep cave there from which a stream flowed that was literally called the Gates of Hades because it was believed this was a gate for the god Baal to run in and out from the underworld. In many ways, Caesarea Philippi was a first century Las Vegas, first century Sin City. Rabbis taught that no good Jew would ever go there. But this is the backdrop for Peter's confession of Christ. This prediction of his death and the call to take up one's cross is against the backdrop as they're standing there in Caesarea Philippi. Why does that matter? Because it is there that Jesus tells Peter after his confession, what? That the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. 
And he's standing literally in front of what people thought were the gates of hell. Incredible object lesson that he is doing for the disciples here. Jesus is putting evil on notice here. It's subtle, but it's there. He's taking the disciples to one of the most notoriously twisted places in the region and declared victory. Gates are, by the way, defensive, aren't they? A city builds a wall and puts a gate in to defend itself from potential aggressors. We tend, in our day and age, to feel like evil is the aggressor, that the forces against God and humanity are moving forward. In some days, the news can seem awful like that's true. But Jesus is declaring the opposite. The gates of hell cannot prevail. That means that God is on the offensive. Jesus indicates here a tremendous shift in the battle, an assurance of victory against evil, and even the evil one himself. In the words of C.S. Lewis, Aslan is on the move. And rising up behind the city of Caesarea Philippi is Mount Hermon. And if you thought what was going on in the city was bad, what went on in the mountain was even worse. Out and out rebellion against God. It was the path of rebellion against God if you go back to Genesis. So Jesus took with him, this is where your gospel picks up today, took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. That would have been Mount Hermon. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became radiant, intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. He goes up, they go up on the mountain that overlooks Caesarea Philippi, that overlooks the gates of hell. And there Jesus, his glory is revealed to the inner circle of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. It's as if Jesus gives them a peek behind the curtain. They see that they have been right all along. Their faith has been well placed. This is indeed the Messiah, the Christ. And they learn in this event the true nature of Jesus. His divinity is allowed to shine through. The image of radiant light speaks of power and truth. The image of white clothes represent purity. That's why when you are baptized in old traditions, and even now a lot of times we dress in a white robe, cleansed from sin. So Jesus' clothes are radiant white. It's not just another teacher or healer. This is God incarnate. This is he who will defeat the gates of hell. Then we read, there appeared to them Elijah and Moses and they were talking with Jesus. I love the way Mark gives us these things as throwaway lines. Just sort of, oh, by the way, Elijah and Moses were standing there too. It's kind of a big deal. The great lawgiver and the great prophet appear with Jesus. This is a tremendous sign for the disciples because Jesus is the fulfillment of both the law and the prophets. Everything that they were pointing to comes to fruition in Jesus. Everything throughout history, throughout the history of God's pursuit of mankind, was made visible to the disciples in the transfigured Jesus. It's a tremendous moment. Look at what happens next. Not Peter's words, but what actually happens in the scene. We'll come back to Peter's words in a minute. Verse 7. A cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Now, as a Jew, this would have brought you to your feet and then flat on your face. And it should for us as well. The image of the cloud should bring to mind of how God led his people in the, to the promised land. Exodus 13, 21. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. The cloud was associated with the glory of God and his very presence. Exodus 40, 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So the cloud is significant. This isn't just a little fog bank rolling across the mountain at this point. This is God. This is how the biblical writers want us to see and understand that God is made present here. Jesus' identity is confirmed. This, this is my beloved son. Greater than Elijah, greater than Moses. Totally unique. The way, the truth, and the life. Listen to him. 
J.C. Ryle said this about the voice of God in this particular passage. He is the great teacher. They who would be wise must learn of him. He is the light of the world. They that would not err must follow him. He is the head of the church. They that would be members of his mystical body, as we pray at the end of this Mass, must ever look to him. So what can we learn from this event? What encouragement do we take from this gospel lesson? I'd like to offer four lessons from the Transfiguration for you. The first is the uniqueness of Jesus. Standing with Moses and Elijah, God says, This is my son, listen to him. He didn't say, These are my sons, listen to them. He said, This is my son, listen to him. This does not diminish Moses and Elijah or their roles as much as it speaks to the uniqueness of Jesus. He is simply incomparable. We have a lot of voices that call to us for allegiance, for our attention. And God says, this is my son, listen to him. This is the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, as we say in John 14, 6. This is why the apostles boldly claimed in Acts 4, 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven by men by which we must be saved. Totally unique. The uniqueness of Jesus. Secondly, the triumph of Jesus. The Father's affirmation of Jesus reminds us of his ultimate victory over sin, evil, and death. He stands over all idols, everything that leads us astray, and all of our misguided attempts to find him, just as he stood on Mount Hermon overlooking those very things that day. The gates of hell will not prevail. He is the Christus victor. He is Christ the victor. Thirdly, the encouragement of Jesus. We should see in this great encouragement. There is so much in our world that seeks to drag us down. So much that tries to pull us away from our hope and our faith in Christ. We hear so much tragedy and heartbreak. But in his transfiguration, we are reminded that our faith is well placed. That we are not mistaken. This is the son of the living God. This is the one who gave his life for us. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. To have confidence in the encouragement of Jesus. And fourthly, this event gives us confidence to return to the valley. This may be the most practically applicable point. Our human tendency is to seek the mountaintop experiences. And when we find one, we want to stay there. What did Peter say? It's good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And I love Mark's little commentary there, for he did not know what to say. <laughs> but give it, leave it to Peter. He'll say something, that's for sure. But the point of the experience was not to reward them, but to prepare them. Our mountaintop experiences are much the same. They're not there to reward us. They're there to prepare us. It was the journey down the mountain to Jerusalem towards passion and death that was going to test their faith. The truth is, friends, as much as we like the mountaintop experiences, that is not where we are called to live. The work of faith is always done in the valleys. We don't grow or mature on the mountain. We grow and mature in the valleys in the times of testing and strengthening. It is not fun, but it is true. We lean on this event as Peter and James and John did when we face our journey down the mountain and into our own valleys. As we complete the season of Epiphany and move toward Lent, take to heart the lessons of the Transfiguration. Draw strength from the uniqueness, the triumph, the encouragement, and the confidence that is ours in Christ. And as the Collect says, May we pray that God will grant us, beholding the faith of the light of his Son's countenance, that we may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.